started. How are you? Um, my name is Deirdre Conroy, and I'm very happy to see everyone here tonight. Um, tonight's topic is the importance of sleep. Who feels sleep deprived? Lots of hands. So we, the, the talk tonight is gonna span across um, a wide range of ages, but then at, towards the end, we're really gonna focus on adolescence, high school, college age, and the problem of sleep in that population. The way tonight is gonna work is I'm gonna talk for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, Joel will come up and get, show you a, a brief video with an, a very interesting interview that he conducted with someone who has struggled with getting enough sleep. Um, and then your job tonight is to think about what we're telling you, talking to you about, and then write any questions that you can think of. And at the end, I will collect your cards and distribute them amongst ourselves, and we'll just have a discussion. So um, I find that most people get most benefit from just having a discussion and um, getting their questions answered, so that's how we'll end the night. Sound okay? Okay. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Deirdre. I work at the uh, University of Michigan Department of Psychiatry. I am a board certified sleep um, medicine specialist, board certified in behavioral sleep medicine, and also a clinical psychologist. So without further ado, uh, our panel members shrunk tonight, unfortunately, um, by, by one. Dr. Hirschner will not be here tonight. But we do have Joel Benedict. I said that right. I did, I did not shrink. He did not shrink. Uh, <laughs> he is here. Uh, he is a, a social worker here uh, in the Saline area schools. We also have Dr. Pearson, Dr. Brian Pearson, who is a licensed psychologist and clinical director of Still Waters Counseling. Uh, I also noticed there's some brochures at the end of the table in the entryway there uh, if you are interested in more information from him. So the plan for our discussion is what the state of affairs are in terms of sleep in this country and probably uh, internationally as well. How does sleep affect us? And how does not getting enough sleep affect our bodies and our minds? We will then focus on why do we need sleep? Many people believe that sleep is just a way to kind of pass the time and that we don't need it and you know you can sleep when you're dead. Has anyone heard that? Not true. And you're gonna learn a little bit more about that. Sleep in adolescence. This has become a major problem in our society and it is affecting um, the adolescence grades, uh, emotional health, um, and uh, mental health. Then we'll see a short video. So the Center for Disease Control has now called insufficient sleep in our country an, a public health epidemic. Okay, so this is a problem that has been evolving um, over the many years and is perpetuated by homework, demands, 24-hour society. So here are some stats from a recent study. So 40% of us in the US uh, are reporting getting less than seven hours of sleep. More than 70 million people report getting less than six hours of sleep. 25 million people have a sleep disorder that's called obstructive sleep apnea. It's abbreviated OSA. Um, and I can tell you more about that later, but many uh, people have a sleep disorder where they stop breathing several times during the night, which can contribute to uh, insufficient sleep and feeling tired the next day. Drowsy drivers are responsible for 21% of fatal accidents in this country. The tricky thing about um, accidents, when you read about fatal crashes, if it's drug or alcohol related, they can test the, the driver, right? They give them um, a, a sobriety test. Does anyone know what the test is to see if someone's sleep deprived? Silence. No, because we don't have one. That's what's so tricky. It's many, many people are on the roads right now with insufficient sleep, but we, there's no way to, to, to tell that fact unless you ask, you know, do a retrospective history. But it's really contributing to a lot of fatal accidents. 
Insufficient sleep contributes to a number of physiological health complications and psychiatric uh, problems, which I'm gonna go into in more detail. But as the slide shows, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, the list goes on, okay? So this is a physiological problem as well. And we know it, everyone in this room knows that when they don't sleep well, when you're chronically not getting enough sleep, then this affects your quality of life, right? I just don't feel rested. I'm not gonna enjoy the party tomorrow. Um, I just wanna get a good night's sleep. So it affects the quality of your life as well as mental health. And that's what you know, the three of us focus on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's talk about how does sleep deprivation affect us? So you can see a list here, a long list of things. I'm not going to read every one out to you, but as you can see, there are so many uh, behavioral, emotional, mood problems that result from not getting enough sleep. Even the way that alcohol affects our body can be affected if we haven't had enough sleep. Um, we might be more likely to take risks and engage in risky behaviors. Um, we are impaired with our uh, reaction times. So while we're driving, this could relate to playing sports, which I'll get to later. On the right side, physiological problems. So insulin resistance, glucose problems, uh, problems with our appetites, uh, blunted responses to vaccination, right? So we're all having our children vaccinated. We get our, our vaccinations for the flu. What if you're chronically sleep deprived? Does it affect you differently? Studies continually suggest that it might. So it's a, fact, a, a factor in so many things in our day-to-day -day life. This is a slide that really shows you how sleep is affecting the body. When you're not getting enough sleep, it affects our brain. And this shows up as being a little bit more grouchy, maybe more likely to snap at someone, yawning, might even be hallucinating if you really had a lot of sleep deprivation. Impaired immune system, so anyone here get a lot of um, colds, they feel like if they're not sleeping, they get sick more often. Okay, that might be a, a consequence. Heart rate problems. So a number of these factors, a number of physiological complications can result from not getting enough sleep. And when I say getting enough sleep, I wanna add that this is not getting enough for you and your, your physiology. Everyone in this room has a different sleep requirement. So some people might need six hours, some people might need nine hours, whatever that number is for you, that, and if you're not getting that, that's what matters. Keep, keep that in mind as we continue our discussion tonight no one number of hours necessarily fits every body in, uh, in this room. I mentioned earlier that, that sleep deprivation can affect our bodies and uh, in the way, um, and, and alcohol and how and alcohol interacts with our body. And I just wanted to show you a slide from a study that shows that sleep deprivation can be as impairing as the effects of alcohol in our performance. So what you're looking at in the slide is on the bottom here, we have hours of wakefulness. And on the, on the left side, we have performance on a, vigi a vigilance task, asking someone to do something very basic. We see that as you go longer without sleep, your performance starts to decline. And then it comes, it actually comes back up a little bit. On the right hand side, we have a similar performance in people whose blood alcohol concentration ranged between 0.05 and 0.10. So take home messages, you can be as impaired with sleep deprivation as with alcohol, right? So keeping that in mind, we've all heard the message about drinking and driving. Is the message about sleeping and driving out as much? What else is an epidemic in this country? Obesity. obesity. Okay, so we have two of it, lack of sleep and obesity. Is there a connection, do we think? Well, studies are showing that there may be. 
So these pictures are from a study that is, that's going on in Chicago where they basically have young adults come into a sleep uh, or a laboratory and they give them, look at this great food, all the food that they can eat, all the junk food that they want, and they test them at different numbers of hours of sleep. So they sleep deprive them. And then basically look at what are they eating, how much are they eating? What do you think the study showed? Any ideas? How did sleep deprivation affect? Think about you when you're really sleep deprived. What do you crave? Junk food, I heard, junk food. And that's exactly what they, they found, that when the people got four hours of sleep, four and a half hours of sleep compared to eight and a half hours of sleep, there was a major difference in what they ate in terms of number of calories and the types of food that they ate. So they tended to eat more carbohydrates, more fats, um, and less, less protein. So the craving was for, for different types of food. So keeping that in mind in the interaction with how much sleep we get. So why do we need sleep? Memory, 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 right? Everyone wants to do well on tests. They want to uh, learn for their job. They want to remember a talk they have to do the next day. All of this has to do with getting a proper amount of hours of sleep so that we can process what we've learned that day and remember it the next day. So memories are consolidated. It helps us to regulate our emotions. So anyone who's had a child, what happens when you see a child in the grocery store and they're having a tantrum or they're screaming, crying? What's the first thing someone says? They need to be home sleeping. They need a nap. It's just, he's just tired. But can we do that as adults in our workplace? No, but it really does happen in kids as well as adults, is that we our ability to regulate our emotions, which means, am I gonna reach out? Am I gonna yell at this person? Or am I gonna cool, calm myself down? We're more likely to be more impulsive, and it can be very challenging to regulate those processes. This has also been shown with the areas of the brain that control aggression. So I'm showing you a couple slides of a brain here. Uh, the top uh, slide shows a circle around an area of the brain called the amygdala. And the amygdala showed more reaction. It was showing more activity in the people that were sleep deprived compared to the control group. So the sleep deprived ones are the red circles and the green on the top are the, sleep, the controls. So we actually see physiological changes in the brain in people who are sleep deprived. I, I was confused by that slide. Do you, well, why is it higher on the right? Or are these two different people or is this just, oh, it's a different, it, different shot when the top is So the, yeah, the, the question is about whether this was in different people. So it's the same person when getting a different amount of sleep. So they're comparing a, a control group or a control person um, and then the sleep deprived. Control condition, sleep deprived condition. And you see that the amygdala changes with the sleep deprivation. Uh, sleep also supports our ability to make decisions. So the frontal lobe of our brain and the way that works, being able to be creative, think abstractly. So. Um, this can affect your ability to write, um, to think on the ball. So if you think about an, an adolescence, right, we call sleep in adolescence the perfect storm because there are so many different factors that are starting to interfere with the ability to get a proper night's sleep. So there's biological, environmental, and social. The sleep deprivation can also affect athletic performance on the field and also the ability to regulate emotions. And that's what I'm gonna kind of walk you through. It's normal for uh, when children move into the adolescent ages, 13 to 19, to start sleeping a little bit less. That's part of the de uh, development. However, there are some other changes too. There's more demands in high school so by 12th grade, 23% of youth report sleeping at least eight hours. 
and only 5% sleep of eight, uh, an average of eight hours, 80% studies show are getting less than the recommended amount of time uh, asleep. So 56% of teens report getting less sleep than they need. So clearly they're sleep deprived. And I mentioned that there are all these different factors that play a role. In adolescence, the brain starts to change and starts to shift to a later time. So we all have an internal biological clock that regulates our sleep. And in adolescence, the tendency is to try to want to go to bed later and later and wake up later and later. Who's experienced this? Yes, many of us. And it still can happen in adults, but it starts to happen in teenagers. So it's important to consider the biological changes that are happening in adolescence. It's not always, uh, she just won't get up on Sundays and she's being lazy. There are some actual changes that happen in the brain that promote a later time to bed and time to wake up. This is in stark contrast to the early start times of schools. Kids, adolescents are waking up, what, what time, six? maybe 545, that may be in some cases directly in the middle of their sleep period or the time that they would naturally be sleeping. It's like if I, let's say I go to bed at 11 p.m. and wake up at 7 a.m., that would be me going to work at four in the morning. So we know that we don't perform well in the middle of our nights. That's what it's like for a teenager. So you can imagine how their first period goes. Environmental factors, we're gonna hear a little bit more about this in a video in a few uh, minutes, but we all know the demands, if you wanna do well in school, there's a lot of studying and early class times. There's also uh, electronic media, there's, there's TV, there's internet, there's a lot of other um, uh, demands and, and desires to do other things besides sleep. So I mentioned a little bit of the environmental differences. So sleeping late on the weekends compared to waking up early on that Monday morning is almost like a chronic jet lag, um, both for adolescents and for adults. So we have a phenomenon that we talk to people about called social jet lag. It's when you sleep later on the weekends and then you have to get up for work or school early on Monday morning. There's also a huge social factor about sleep. Right? Who needs to sleep? I mentioned this earlier, uh, sleep when I'm dead. There's uh, many people who don't value sleep and in the sports teams don't necessarily um, go against this. This is a slide from a football player from the Seattle Seahawks, Russell Wilson, who coined the hashtag no time to sleep. Actually made bracelets and t-shirts uh, with this logo, kind of promoting this, you don't need sleep, not valuable. So this results in some chronic sleep deprivation. A word about athletic performance for any of you in the room who play sports uh, for high school or for college, not getting enough sleep can definitely impact your reaction time. Anybody who's playing a sport has to work on that reaction time. It also affects perceived exertion and pain ratings. So you can imagine if you're feeling more of the pain or you're feeling more tired on the field, um, you might not do as well in the game that day. 70% of college students are reporting less than eight hours of sleep. There's a big change when you start playing to, um, on a team where you're traveling to different time zones. Uh, there can be effects from traveling to those time zones compared to your own. So if you're playing a game at 8 p.m. on the east or the west coast and that's not your home time zone, you're not gonna perform as well. And studies have shown this time and time again. So that's why there are people working on sleep in professional, either collegiate athletes or professional athletes. Last part, I wanna mention a few things about the effect of sleep loss on uh, our emotional health. There's a lot, there are many, many studies that are linking chronic sleep deprivation to the onset of depression and to perpetuate depression once it's, it's uh, been established. So the problem can be that more kids, excuse me, more 
adolescents with depressive symptoms may also be considering harming themselves or even having suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation. And they've done a few studies where they look back, they have um, this, the adolescent who had completed suicide and they uh, and analyze their notes that they've left behind. And a very large percentage of them mention sleep deprivation or sleep problems in the weeks preceding the event. So not something to take lightly. So the, one of the ma major risks is suicide. So suicide completers are 10 times more likely to have sleep problems prior to suicide than, than controls. This is a slide looking at suicide and total sleep time. And you can see on the left hand side in light blue, less than seven hours of sleep, we have an increase in suicidal thoughts and an in, in more uh, a higher percentage of suicide attempts that compared to those that get more than nine hours of sleep. Grades are also affected by poor sleep. Again, we're comparing more than nine hours to less than six hours. And we see that the grade point average in those getting more than nine hours is higher than those with less than six hours. And lastly, in a poll, in a national poll, the A students slept 15 minutes more than, than B students, who slept 11 minutes more than C students, and 10 minutes more than D students. We actually could compare the number of minutes difference in the grades. All-nighters, who's done an all-nighter? Okay, <laughs> I even saw an eye roll. Oh, that's me. And so the belief is if I just study all night, then I'll just go into the test and I'll remember everything because I just, I just went through it. Problem is that your brain isn't working the same as it would the night before. And the sleep that you get is going to help you consolidate those memories and the different types of sleep that you get. So studies show time and time again that that's not necessarily the best uh, strategy for the next day's tests. So, so just to kind of summarize what I just said, sleeping is always better than pulling an all-nighter. So what I've told you so far is that sleep deprivation can affect us physiologically and with our mental health, also our performance in school and on the athletic fields. There's a huge stigma against getting a lot of sleep, which we hope to, to change or getting enough sleep and that sleep can definitely affect um, our risk for developing depression and emotional regulation. So if I haven't convinced you, I'm gonna turn this over to Joel. I'll put this video on. So one moment while we switch over and we're gonna hear from a student suffering from sleep problems. Sleep better. Uh, currently, a um, junior in high school, or in uh, college, excuse me, but has a good recollection of uh, sleep uh, uh, issues uh, when, when younger or first and, and or uh, up till now. So, could you tell me a little bit, uh, Abigail, about your uh, sleep patterns in high school? Sure. So, in high school, I would have to wake up around 6, 6 30 in the morning for school every day, and I would hardly get to sleep sometime between 12 30 and 30 in the morning every night, and so I would get you know, five to six hours of sleep every night. And did you feel like you got enough sleep? Definitely not, no. Uh, and what, what prevented you from getting enough sleep? Well, I would get home after school and I would have practice for one or two sports and then lots and lots of homework, and I ended up usually staying late, staying up very late at night doing homework. And that was the main reason I didn't get enough sleep. What constituted lots of homework? I would say I usually had probably around two or three hours of homework every night. It sort of depended on uh, what class I was taking at the time, but usually essays, research papers. Once I was a junior and senior working on college essays and applications, also took a lot of time. And did you feel like there was an impact from the lack of sleep? Absolutely. On my schoolwork and uh, in class, I was always tired. I was always falling asleep in class. It was difficult for me to pay attention, um, but it sort of became something that I was used to, and so I worked around that all the time. So, so you find yourself falling asleep in high school, and how about now uh, in college? Has uh, 
that carry over at all? Yes, I'm definitely able to plan my schedule now that I'm in college, and so I can plan my classes later, and it's less likely for me to fall asleep in class, but there's nights that I do, once again, get only four, five, six hours of sleep, then I find myself falling asleep in class. And have you ever had a teacher in high school mention that you look sleepy or tired? Yes, teachers used to say to the class as a whole, all the time, you all look so tired. Because all of us were tired, no one got enough sleep. And do you think that was because of the rigor of the courses or just the demands of, uh, what would you, what would you attribute that to? I think it's a combination of the rigors of our courses. We had a lot of work, we had a lot of pressure to complete all of this work, do AP classes and do extra essays. And then we had a lot of pressure to do a lot of other activities, sports, clubs, service projects. So there was just a lot of things that we had to do after school that caused us to stay up really late. And um, do you think your parents realized how those things you got? I think yes. My parents were always telling me, should you go to bed, it's late, go to sleep, get some sleep. But I think they were also aware that I was staying up to do things that I had to do. And so they weren't going to make me go to sleep when they knew I still had homework to finish or when they knew I still had um, applications to work on. And on days when you didn't get enough sleep, uh, you seemed like quite regular based on before. Did you feel like um, there was an impact on you, uh, on your emotional state? Do you think you can talk about that? Or do you have any knowledge? Or um, I. Irritable or just tired? Definitely in the mornings, I wouldn't want to talk to anyone. My mom or dad asked me a question in the morning, I would give them a grunt instead of an answer. Definitely irritable in the morning and I would get really tired during the middle or towards the end of the school day as well. But aside from that, I, I don't really have an answer. Okay, and then I guess I wonder, do you have any thoughts about possible remedies? Yes, so I think that teachers in general need to be aware that students are under all this pressure, not only from school, but from sports and from other activities. And with this awareness, I would like them to cut back on some of their assignments so that students have less work to do at home and maybe they can do more during the school day. Also, just in general, cutting back on pressure for kids to have to do so many activities in addition to school. It really is. What was causing the pressure if you do all the activities? What was the other uh, uh, I'd say in general, college application processes, every student wanted to have three or four activities that made them stand out on their application. So kids were doing um, sports, honor societies, clubs, outside projects, anything that you could put on your resume to make you look more attractive to a college. And that just adds up and takes up so much time. Did, did, were you doing any of it for fun or? Oh, yes, absolutely. All of the, personally, all of the activities that I did in addition to school were fun. I don't know if that's the same for everyone else, but personally I chose activities that were fun and also attractive to colleges. So it was a personal choice but a personal choice based on what I also thought would help me get into school. And how, and guys, how far back did you feel like pressure that you were staying up super late? I would say the beginning of high school, in ninth grade, maybe beginning of 10th grade, that's when I started definitely staying up a lot later and getting less sleep and feeling that pressure to do things for college. Okay, and you fall asleep sort of, uh, would you fall asleep in the morning hours or uh, is there any particular pattern or just throughout the day? You mean falling asleep in school? Class? Yeah, fall asleep. Um, probably more, I would say the second class of the day is always when I fell asleep. Because the first class, I was always still in shock from being awake. But by the second class, it would have been when I fell asleep. I was saying, anyway, Abby, I thank you and uh, I wish you the best of luck in your uh, early student endeavors. Thank you very much. This is an interview with Abigail. This is Sharon Logan. So uh, that's pretty monotone in that. Um, but Abigail, uh, I think, w went to a school, high school similar to Celine, probably in terms of academic pressure and similar, similar demographics, uh, somewhere in Maryland. Uh, I talked to her a little, I didn't ask in the interview, uh, but afterwards, if any of uh, her friends had ever gotten in an accident because of lack of sleep, a car accident, she said no. I asked her if any of them had ever used you know, methamphetamine or some, some stimulant to stay awake. She said no, which I, I thought that was good. Um, 
she did share that she was tardy 37 times in her senior year and that she wrote herself a note for each of those and excused them. So I said, did your parents know that? And yeah, they, they were aware of that. So, um, and she's doing well at Michigan. Uh, I have a junior myself in, uh, in high school and I see a lot of parallels when I talk to her uh, with my own daughter. So uh, there you go, thank you. So just one last slide here, some things that you can do, make sleep a priority. We haven't already emphasized that. Um, one of the things I recommend to patients that I see in the clinic is to create what's called a buffer zone, which means the hour or 45 minutes to an hour before you go to bed, put everything away, have a quiet period that doesn't involve doing schoolwork or work work, um, where you're rushing, 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 or thinking about something and then transitioning to trying to go to sleep right away. Um, you need to ease into it. So creating a buffer zone in the hour before you go to bed. Keeping a consistent sleep-wake schedule. This is very difficult, um, I understand, on the weekends, but you don't want to suffer from that uh, social jet lag. Limit environmental influences. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that, um, but these are things like phones in the bed or TVs or computer in the bed that can interrupt your sleep. Uh, lastly, exclude uh, electronics from the bedroom if you can. Uh, be disciplined about that. There have been studies that link social media to anxiety, uh, so that we like to limit that for, for our patients. Limit light exposure in the evening, limit screen times. We can talk about that, the effect of light on the biological rhythm, and avoid social media. So there's a few tips for you to take home with you tonight, but we can certainly recommend uh, several others. So at this point, uh, you should all have cards. If you don't have cards, I'm happy to give you some more and pens. And if you have any questions for us, please uh, feel free to send them up to me. Does anyone need a card? Anyone else need cards? Cards? When you're done, I can just come around and, and collect them.
thank you for your very well thought out questions. Boy, we have to put our minds together here. <laughs> so I'm going to have Dr. Pearson start us off. Um, he'll read the question and uh, share his insight. Okay, well, the uh, first question I have here is um, how does the color of light affect your sleep? Uh, specifically, it says blue light from electronics versus red light for a night light. Um, the quick answer to this is that the people who make monitors and screens are very smart people. And the way that you increase the clarity of a screen is to tune it to our eyes, which see the best at early afternoon, where there is a lot of blue light. Um, so screens emit a lot of blue light. And when that happens, um, our brains see a lot of blue light and interpret that as being, it's one o'clock in the afternoon, it's time to wake up and be active. Um, as dusk settles, the blue light fades, and actually yellow light is, I believe, that's what I've heard anyway, is that like the old incandescent lights that were more yellowish, dimmed down, uh, simulate dusk and tell your brain, okay, it's getting darker, it's get, you know, get ready to go to sleep. I'm not sure exactly about the red light uh, myself, but the managing of blue light, I think, is, is one of the keys. <laughs> so I just ca add a comment about the red light. So red light does not suppress a hormone called melatonin. Melatonin is a hormone in your body that helps to regulate your sleep-wake cycle. Melatonin is secreted a few hours before you go to bed. And so when you ha we're exposed to blue light, blue light shuts down production of melatonin. Full spectrum light does as well. Once you start getting into the red lights, that has no physiological influence on melatonin. So actually in our laboratory and in a few research studies that we're doing, we give adolescents these goggles, these red goggles. They look kind of cool and uh, they, they are called blue blocking. So you block out the blue rays and it just, um, all you can see is red. So it doesn't have any effect on your circadian rhythm, your biological rhythm. So red lights, good in the evening, blue lights, good in the morning. Is that just for red light or can you use other colors that just from the voice of blue? And I'm just curious, but some new red uh, orange flash that they have, they do rainbow color kind of things and just go through it's having the change in color and the different colors in that rainbow going to affect things or should it just be red? Red orange. Red orange. I have a, um, an app that I put on my computer screen. I know there are several of them. The one I use is called Flux. And you um, basically put in your zip code and it calculates where on the earth you are at different times. And it changes the type of light that your monitor emits based on what is going on outside. Um, and I have found that to be helpful. Okay, next question is, have there been any long-term effects seen in adults who were maybe chronically sleep-deprived as adolescents? Um, I'm not sure of any specifically, myself, um, but my assumption is the person is talking about physical effects. As a psychologist, I guess I look more at the overall person, and I would say if sleep deprivation is lowering your grade point and making your thinking processes not as sharp, uh, affecting you socially, um, as well as the physiologically. Yes, I mean, the long-term side effects could easily be going to a different college or not getting into the college that you want. Uh, long-term side effects are therefore gonna affect your career, and the people you meet, and your trajectory in life in general. Um, so I'm kind of copping out on that from the physical standpoint. I'll let the medical person, 
I guess, handle the, uh, if there have been any studies about effects, but I can't imagine there wouldn't be. Our, uh, this question uh, is, how could we go about changing the start time of high schools? So that's been a popular topic uh, in, in the media. So m my thought there would be, you know, don't tell me when I said this, uh, it's being taped, we could contact you know, the, the Board of Education or the principal uh, at the high school and say, hey, look, this is a concern I have and uh, see what they say. I think that that is a large scale uh, uh, thing that people would like to change, but I don't know that it's going to happen quickly. And I know uh, some of it probably has to do with bus schedules and lots, lots of other stuff. Um, but it seems that sleeping in a little bit might help kids. So call the Board of Education. Didn't hear it for me. And you want me to read my study? The other question I'll let everybody can speak to. This is sort of it's not specific to sleep. Uh, or maybe it is, but the way the question is written, it just is what, what do you recommend for um, uh, depressed patients specifically? And so um, when you see a question like that, I'm wondering if someone is feeling depressed, then I'd recommend seeking, either talking to somebody afterwards about where one of us, where they could get help, and, and, and or talking to their um, physician or their pediatrician. But specifically with regards to, uh, if it's what you recommend for depressed patients who are also having sleep issues, which then I'll defer to one of these guys. That's a big question. Um, you know, sleep is important to everybody, but once depression sets in, um, it is important to get some treatment, either counseling, or if that is not enough, uh, probably some antidepressant medications. One of the biggest um, symptom of depression is sleep disturbance. Either too little or too much sleep. Um, now the too much tends to be not of the best quality. It tends to be disturbed sleep. But with depression in general, there are a lot of um, things that can be done to try to regulate your sleep cycle. Um, I mean the business call it sleep hygiene. Uh, basically getting habits in place, the environment in place, a lot of supports for regularity of sleep, and what to do if you can't sleep. I mean, the, I could probably talk for a couple hours just on that, but um, you know, with depression, it's critically important to get the sleep cycle regulated. Um, as was shown in the slide, then things like increased risk of suicide, you know, jump in there. I mean, I think the flip side of that that we see all the time is people who are depressed or folks who are depressed are not wanting to get out of bed. So, which is when we're looking at, hey, trying to make that determination, something we always ask, hey, you know, what are some things you're happy about? Or can you share? And do you have trouble getting out of bed? So there are two sides to that. And just to add to that, it becomes very um, I, uh, confusing for the patient as well, or you're, if you're experiencing sleeping too much or having sleep disturbance, um, it could just be that you have a sleep problem that's leading to feeling depressed, or if you'd be feeling depressed is leading you to have a sleep problem. The studies now show that this relationship is bi-directional. So there are studies that show Sleep problems early on in life lead to future um, mood problems, and vice versa. Mood problems can lead, lead to sleep problems. So it's, it, I guess what I'm saying is I wouldn't assume you have one or the other unless you talk to someone to help you tease it apart. Um, that would kind of best, man to, to help create the best management program for you. I mean, so Waters uh, counseling, I do a lot of, um, diagnostic testing, people wondering if they have things like ADHD, depression. And what, it's become one of my standard recommendations is to get a sleep study done. Um, because sleep deprivation can mimic a lot, of, a lot of different things. There are also, I mean, I use an app on my iPhone called Sleep Cycle. And I've used it with clients because I have them say, you know, how many hours of sleep are you getting per night? And they'll tell me. And then I'll say, well, 
download this app, come back next week, and we'll look at it. And they're always, I mean, they're nowhere near accurate. Um, it's really hard to self-observe your own sleep, and especially the quality of your own sleep. Um, and these apps, I mean, they're free, but I've found them to be pretty valuable. Um, you know, seeing where the sleep cycle is being interrupted, really what time somebody gets to sleep. They can tell me they're going to bed at 10, but you know, if you're not getting to sleep until 1.30, that's very different. So getting a measurement is important. So there's a question that is uh, re relating to the last thing that was just said, and the question is, do health monitoring bracelets like Fitbit reliably detect when a person is sleeping? Um, so this has been looked at a bit in the, the, the bit, Fitbit. The Fitbit has uh, been compared to the gold standard, which is um, a sleep study which involves measuring your brain waves and measuring your respiration. And there, there is a pretty good <coughs> correlation with the Fitbits, um, but, I, but I'm not sure about the other ones. There's so many on the market now. Um, as you all know, there's some that people have under their pillows and measuring the movement of the bed, um, and some of them, some of them may not be. So I know the Fitbit can be helpful, but um, we use a medical grade um, device called an ActiWatch. Um, we've been using that for many years. That's that's even that it it can tell when you're moving or when you're still, but it can't tell you necessarily if you're sleeping. It's all, it's all, they're all rest activity monitors. So it becomes a, a bit challenging. Um, the question is, the second one from this um, same card is, what is the objective of a sleep study? Um, and so you had mentioned you send lots of people for sleep studies, so the question is, uh, why? What's the objective? <coughs> so an objective of a sleep study um, typically is to see if there's a physiological sleep problem I mentioned one of them at the start of the talk, which was obstructive sleep apnea. Um, that is a breathing problem in sleep where the airway, the tissues in the airway collapse, and the, therefore the oxygen in the body drops, and the brain recognizes that the oxygen is dropping and therefore wakes, wakes you up. And if you have sleep apnea, you may be waking up many, many times at night, but not even having any re recollection of, of doing so. So all you know is that you're pretty sleepy and tired the next day. And the only way you know if you have sleep apnea is on a sleep study. Uh, sleep studies also can look at things like periodic leg movements. Um, so these are kicks or jerks in sleep. Um, and they can also um, tell you about heart, heart changes um, as well as the quality of your sleep because also you have an EEG, so we're measuring your brain waves. So it is, to rule out any kind of physiological sleep disturbance. Um, I, to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I would say, like, as a rule, the first thing in mental health with other mental health issues is that we want to rule out something physio organic, so sleep study or you know, with any mental health uh, issue. If we're not sure if there's something going on other than a psychological component, the first thing we want to do is see your doctor, be sure that it's not an organic issue. Yeah, I just had a general question about sleep apnea. Um, is it very common in teenagers? It seems to me that most people with sleep apnea are usually middle-aged guys that are overweight, but. I hear that. So is, how common is sleep apnea in the adolescent population? I mean, this is totally anecdotal. But our youngest child, who's a uh, senior in college right now, just recently got tonsil reduction surgery um, for that very reason. He was, uh, basically when he came home, he was snoring and very clearly stopping breathing multiple times. Um, and so we got the sleep study done, and they found it was because of basically enlarged structures in there. He is not overweight. As a matter of fact, he's quite slender and quite fit, and I'm not sure what happened uh, because it was a relatively new issue. But you know, he is 21 years old now, and you know, he just had that surgery, and uh, it seems to be helping a lot. Now, overall, <laughs> I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> 
I will say that uh, large tonsils in children are the most common cause of sleep apnea, and that tonsillectomies are the first line treatment. Um, and studies have shown, actually studies at the University of Michigan by the director of the Sleep Disorder Center, Dr. Chairman, have found that children have, that have had ADHD-like -like symptoms, so hyperactivity, not be able to sit still, difficulty focusing, who had large tonsils and were found to have sleep apnea, that went on to have ton tonsillectomies actually did <coughs> much better in their schoolwork and their behavior. So it, it, the, the idea, which you, you know, lots of people say, well, the sleep apnea is just in larger, pre predominantly male, um, that's, you know, there are other uh, ways uh, that, in other structures that can cause sleep apnea, like large tonsils, restricted upper airway, your nasal passages. Um, so it can happen at many levels and even in, in thin, fit people. So if you snore and you're sleepy the next day, um, consider that. Is uh, sleep apnea a hereditary item? So about the mother-in-law has sleep apnea, her daughter has it, will the other two children most likely have it, or is it just kind of by luck? So is sleep apnea hereditary? So what, what happens is you start to, in, you inherit the structure of your relatives, the way your face is formed, the way your upper airway is formed. So it, yes, it, it is, but <laughs> doesn't mean you'll necessarily have it, oh, okay, <laughs> but, but tends to run in families. You um, look, at, look to see if your face resembles those in your family that have it, um, and that might help, but it does tend to run in families. Any other comments on that? Okay, I kind of always wanted to be a talk show host, so I like walking around <laughs> with a microphone. <laughs> Um, do you guys have another one you want to take? Okay, so while they're looking, these are quick, quick answers. Um, are dizziness and nausea symptoms of sleep deprivation? Yes, it can be. It can be a lot of other things, but uh, sleep deprivation can be one of them. What actions are typically taken as a result of a sleep study, meds, etc.? Et it depends on what they find. If they find you have sleep apnea, they're going to talk to you about um, three, three options, gold standard is CPAP, that CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. It is a device that blows air into the upper airway to keep it open. Um, that's the most commonly prescribed, most effective treatment. There's also an oral appliance, a mouth guard that you sleep with, or surgeries. Um, I mentioned the surgeries in, in kids, tonsillectomy. Is there anything that can be done to decrease the amount of sleep you need? Hmm. I don't. I don't think so. I think that that's almost like um, you know the number of hours can be compared to something that you your individual makeup, your individual need. Lots of people try, but I don't. I can't think of anything. Interesting question. Are there any negative physiological symptoms of too much sleep? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I think if one is truly rested, you wake up. Uh, that's been, you know, my experience and a lot of other people's experience is you just wake up and you are alert. Doesn't mean you can't take naps. Um, but sleeping is a biological necessity. And I think once that need is no longer there, if you're truly getting enough sleep, I, I think it would be difficult for the body to go back to sleep. Um, I can't think of anything physiologically. I would add that, you know, we are talking a lot about sleep deprivation, assuming that you need a certain amount of sleep and you're not getting it. But think about the other parallel. We, we deal with a lot of people with excessive daytime sleepiness. There are sleep disorders. Um, one is called 
hypersomnolence, meaning you, you, you sleep and sleep and just can never feel rested. And if that's you, that you should talk to your doctor about that. There are also disorders like narcolepsy. There are several symptoms that, you, that go along with that. If you feel like you're um, falling asleep unintentionally, um, having sleep attacks and some other symptoms, talk to your doctor. Um, there are some unusual sleep disorders that also involve excessive sleepiness. Um, so if you're wondering if you're having unusual symptoms like that, too much sleep, talk to your doctor. Um, I'll take one. Uh, how does someone get a referral to a sleep clinic get help for sleep issues? Great question. Um, I would say these days, if you're in, if you see your primary care physician, your primary care physician can make a referral to a sleep disorder center. Um, and you mentioned that you, how do you, how do you make your referrals? How do you, if someone went to see you, what would, they, what would happen? Yeah, if I um, make a recommendation, basically, it, most of the time your uh, family doctor mm -hmm. just has to make that referral, we'll give you a, a name and a phone number to call. And, a lot of times they'll even make that appointment for you. Um, some insurances require that in order to pay for it, that there be a referral from a medical professional. Others, though, you can just call and make it yourself. But I would just go to your family doctor. Um, big question again. Is it possible to change or alter your normal sleep-wake cycle? For example, if you normally sleep from 12 a.m. to 7 a.m., can that be changed to move back to 10.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m.? How, what routines, or possibly drugs? Um, yes, there are ways to alter <coughs> the sleep cycle. You can't really change the circadian rhythm, but a large part of what I do in helping people to sleep is setting up a routine, good sleep hygiene, and a lot of that comes from just setting a bedtime and setting a time to get up no matter what, even if you go past your bedtime. Um, for example, um, I tend to go to sleep at 10.30 and get up you know, around 6.30, but if I stay up until 1 for some reason, it's best for me still to get up at 6.30 and to take a nap a little bit later, before 4 p.m. Studies have shown you get much more rest. I mean, rather than sleeping two hours later, you know, hitting snooze, you're much better off getting up for a few hours than taking a two-hour nap. Your body is gonna respond much better to that, and you're gonna feel more rested. Setting rituals. No screens before, like an hour before get that light out and low stimulation activity. Um, one of the things I did just, I don't know how I did it, I into rituals I guess and uh, in college I was able to do that an hour before I went to bed I had, you know, first I do this and I take a shower and then I, I had a, just a very set schedule and what that does is your brain over time learns that okay we're getting ready to and you just keep that ritual, no matter what. I've had, I've had four kids, and uh, a couple of them have had to have dramatic resets of uh, sleep cycle, and it's difficult, but if you have like a dramatic shift, I've had kids that are totally reversed sleep cycle. They're up all night and they're sleeping during the day. Um, staying up an entire day, forcing yourself to stay up, up and then going to bed at that 10.30 or whatever it is. It's really, really difficult, but it does kind of a hard reset on that cycle so you can get a fresh start. Uh, there's lots of other things, foods to avoid, drinks to avoid, obviously caffeine, sugars, fats you want to avoid at night, uh, nuts and things like that have tryptophan, so they'll help you sleep. But, uh, I mean, there are literally hundreds of things that you can do, but yes, you can reset it. Yes, it's hard. Another question, uh, something you mentioned. Did you say no naps after 4 p.m.? Yes, I did. Um, right. For little ones, what would be the, a good time frame for a nap then? 
I'm talking not about little ones, mm -hmm. okay. um, with adolescents and adults, most people, if they nap four o'clock or after, they're gonna have trouble getting to sleep at their normal bedtime. That's the main thing, is that if you take a nap too late, it's gonna interfere with that solid night's sleep. So that rule does not go for? Little kids. The younger <coughs> Little kids fall asleep when they need to fall asleep. <laughs> I always envy them that. Great, so we're on the topic of this shifting of the clock and there's some other questions here that people have asked as well um, that have to do with sh shifting your sleep schedule. Um, there's a question here about what would you recommend for people who work night shifts? Um, so we uh, work with people with these types of problems, with these body clock problems and it is possible to shift. We put people on very strict um, plans that involve two major inputs to your biological clock. Does anyone know what they are? Yes. Bright, sunny day, light. So we talked about light and the different colors, but the use of bright light therapy to shift the clock is the most effective way to help your body um, to a different time. Um, and the use of light at particular times of day can help shift the clock. So wherever you are, in this example, 12 to, if someone is sleeping from 12 to seven and you wanna sleep from, let's say, 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., you'd use light at a certain time, for example, in the morning. So. This is all done with the help of a, of a sleep professional to understand your circadian clock and to help you shift that. There are also very specific things that we tell our shift workers to do um, to help them on their shift, their night shift. It's very difficult. People who work the night shift have a tough time. We are, human beings are programmed <coughs> to be awake during the day and to sleep at night. And so when you chronically work at an opposite time, it's difficult and so you always have to be mindful of light and dark and food schedules. Um, so while it's possible, it can be challenging to, to follow up on what you said, but we really do work with light and dark. People kind of forget about dark therapy. There's so much light pollution that we're exposed to where if these lights are on, um, our brains aren't necessarily used to this. We're, uh, this light is suppressing our melatonin for many of us. So we recommend dim light conditions at specific time for people as well. It's very seemingly simple, but it matters what time. Um, how do you find out how many hours is enough for you? I imagine this is for sleep. Um, this is a great question, and you might have um, some thoughts as well. What I usually tell people is, or ask, have you ever had an opportunity where you have a vacation, if you go home on holiday, to just sleep out? and you have no obligations for like a two week period. And people are shaking their heads like, that's never happened, because that's usually the answer I get. No, of course not. But if you do, you kind of get a sense of how many hours you're naturally going to sleep. If you don't use an alarm, you, you go to sleep when you're sleepy, you wake up when you, your body naturally wakes up, and then, figure, and then count how many hours of sleep you're getting. That's typically how many hours. So the question was, what do I think of swing shifts? Um, so these are people who, who work rotating shifts. Very difficult, very difficult to work with. Still work with light and dark. Sometimes we'll have a, a medication on board to help with sleep. Other times, if that's not possible for people on call, I've worked with train conductors, I've worked with pilots, I've worked, you know, so sometimes you, medication is not an option. So it's very difficult um, to work swing shifts. Uh, Couple more questions. There's a lot of questions about memory. I talked a lot about how memory is helped out by sleep. What I do want to add to that is the way that we think that this works. Now, I'm not a memory um, specialist by any stretch, but what, what I do know is that the, there are different stages of sleep that we need to go through. REM sleep is one of those stages. So we cycle in and out of REM to non-REM sleep. 
REM sleep is our dream stage of sleep. Dreams can happen in other stages, but mostly in REM sleep. That's the sleep stage that they've found is most commonly linked with the ability to remember. So if you're not sleeping uh, you know, a full, full chunk of time where you're cycling in and out of your sleep and you're getting your REM sleep, then that can impair memory consolidation. But there's a whole literature on this. Um, and so if you're interested in it, um, I can point you into some uh, researchers that do research in that area. Um, nap recommendations heard under 30 minutes is best to allow sleep at night. Uh, <coughs> I've, I know a lot of people that say a power nap of 10 to 20 minutes can be amazingly refreshing. And I think it's a matter of seeing what works for you. I can't do that. That is a great way to ruin an entire day for me. Um, if I take a nap and wake up after 20 minutes, I can't, I've never fully wake up. Uh, what I advise people if they can't do a power nap like that and feel refreshed is to have it be a full 90 minutes, which tends to be how long it takes for a, nor a normal, complete sleep cycle. Great, yes, so I work a lot with uh, people who have insomnia, which is really not the topic we're discussing today, but people with insomnia, I recommend do not nap as they're go doing treatment with me. Any nap during the day can interfere with the quality of sleep that you get, so I strongly recommend no naps. However, if there's a safety precaution, if you need to drive, 30 minute nap, um, if, if, if needed, so. Um, there's another, speaking of insomnia, what do you recommend for handling awakenings in the night, for example, for three hours? Um, so if this happens to you on more than three nights a week, for more than, the, than three months, I recommend you talk to your doctor to get a referral for, to work with someone with insomnia. General recommendations that I make, um, don't stay in bed, don't toss and turn, don't try to get more sleep by lying in bed. Um, I'm sure you might have read this in magazines. Give yourself 20 to 30 minutes of being in bed. If you're not asleep, get up, go do something else. Read, quiet book. And then when you're sleepy enough, you're feeling like you're dozing, then go back to sleep. That helps to reassociate the bed with sleeping instead of tossing and turning. It's one of these um, strategies called stimulus control that we often talk to our patients about. But, uh, but, but if you do wake up and uh, unexplained, I do recommend you talk to your doctor. We need to figure out what it might be. There are hormonal changes that can contribute. Um, so, number of things. So we're gonna do one, maybe one more question. Yes. Um, in my practice, I think the important question to ask if somebody's waking up in the middle of the night and, and staying up is, what is keeping you up? Uh, the most common answer I get is I can't shut my brain off. I've started to think about something and I can't stop it. Um, there are some simple strategies that you can use to try to interrupt that cycle. For those people, I recommend keeping a notepad by the side of your bed so you can write down what you're thinking of. Our brains are very old. Writing is relatively new. Uh, the, in the oral tradition, the brain repeats things that are not completed so that we can remember them. So basically your brain is cycling on this thing to be sure that you will remember it. So if you write it down, you can tell that brain, I write it down, there's nothing I can do about it right now, I will deal with it in the morning. And a lot of times that is enough to stop that cycling and people can get back to sleep. Okay, and then um, finally, long-term cognitive effects of sleep deprivation after sleep patterns improve. This is a great question and it comes up a lot. I talk to people a lot, well, how much am I, am I damaging myself forever? Is this, and I, I just, I, we don't know yet. I think that this is still a relative, sleep itself is a relatively new field. I don't think we have long-term studies that can tell us this yet. It's a great question, I think. We need to have brain imaging studies um, that look at this. <coughs> Any question, other questions from the audience? Can you just quickly def 
define or define again the difference between insomnia and sleep deprivation? Okay, so difference between insomnia and sleep deprivation. Insomnia is people who have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, waking too early, affects their daytime function, but maybe eventually getting that sleep for them, that sleep need. It might be broken up into pieces across the day and night, maybe five hours at night, two hours during the day, but they eventually will get that physiological sleep need. It's just dis distributed unevenly across the day. Sleep deprivation is when you, let's say you have an eight hour sleep requirement and you chronically get six hours of sleep a night. You carry a sleep debt. Uh, so sleep <coughs> deprivation is not getting the sleep that you need. Insomnia is that the sleep that you get is broken up into pieces across the day and night. So inability to get or stay asleep. Is it possible to catch up on sleep if you've had like um, like a week where you've had six hours of sleep that week, but then you start sleeping more the next week? Does it catch up or does it kind of like take a while to go back into that normal? Catching up on sleep. So, so you can kind of catch up on sleep, but it's not proportional to the amount of sleep that you've lost. So if you've gone, you have 30 hours of sleep deprivation, that doesn't mean you're gonna sleep 30 hours straight. What happens is your body is very smart and it knows it's been sleep deprived. So what it does is it throws you into a very deep stage of sleep. So you, you make up for it more quickly. You'll have a lot of slow, we call it slow wave sleep. And so you'll have very deep sleep for a couple of days and then maybe be right back to your, you might have satisfied your sleep need. So think of it as a debt. We can carry our sleep debt so you're thinking of it financially, and then you pay it off, and then you're back to normal. And then you sleep deprive yourself, and you're out of sleep debt again. So that's usually what we do in our societies. We bounce back and forth to that. So you kind of can catch up on it. All right, well thank you so much for everyone who came out tonight for your interesting questions. We will be in front here, so please do talk to us if you have any um, questions. There's material on that back table. Feel free to take as much as you'd like. We have a lot of events coming up. Um, there's, a, there's a run in a couple of weeks for the, for the Depression Center. There's some brochures about Stillwell Centers and um, Celine uh, School. Celine. Celine Live is up there as well, so please do take a look at the, the brochures. Thanks again for coming out tonight. Thank you.